Our second speaker is Geeta Segal. Um, and for, I'm sure uh, many of you know Geeta already. For, she's a very well-known activist and thinker, and we're very honored to have her here tonight as well. Um, she's a writer and journalist on issues of feminism, fundamentalism, and racism. She was head of the gender unit in Amnesty uh, International and was forced out when she went public with her concerns regarding their promotion of a pro-jihad campaigner as a human rights defender. Geeta is also a documentary films director and a women's rights and human rights activist. Geeta, you are very welcome here this evening. Thank you, Kiri, and thank you, Woman's Place, for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and also uh, extremely nervous, but I'll get right into it because I know you want to stick to time. Um, and I know that lots of people actually have, have no clue what this is all about or what I'm going to speak about. So most of what I'm going to say is explaining what happened 11 years ago. I was suspended from Amnesty International for talking to the Sunday Times. And a few months later, in spite of making headline news all over the world, and generating petitions in my defense, signed by feminists and human rights defenders everywhere, I was forced out of the organization. When I was suspended, I issued a statement. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when a great organization must ask, if it lies to itself, can it demand the truth of others? But in defending the torture standard, one of the strongest and most embedded in international human rights law, Amnesty International has sanitized the history of the ex-Guantanamo detainee Muazim Beg and completely failed to recognize the nature of his organization, Cage Prisoners. Cage Prisoners, now called Cage, is still around. Its best known figure, Muazim Beg, who I'd complained about, has long been a fixture in progressive and human rights circles. In spite of a mountain of evidence about his views, drawn from his own autobiography, not material collected under torture. In his, uh, or in his memoir, he, he, he writes that he considered Afghanistan under the Taliban a wonderful state and full of old time values and has taken his family to live there. Information on the CAGE prisoners website revealed that they promoted key Al-Qaeda ideologues as prisoners of belief. In other words, as men being held like amnesty prisoners of conscience solely for their views, not their violent actions or their incitement to violence. About five years after I left Amnesty International, during the height of the ISIS ascendancy across Iraq and Syria, a notorious ISIS executioner known as Jihadi John was unmasked as a British man, Mohammed Mwazi. It turned out he'd been close to Cage, who held a press conference to announce this fact. Now, Mwazi was not the first terrorist to have been associated with Cage, but he was the first whom Asim Qureshi, one of the senior Cage figures, declared to be a beautiful young man in front of the world's television cameras. And he did this after there was video evidence of the horrific executions that Mwazi had conducted. Suddenly, there was renewed interest in Amnesty International's relationship with Cage, and Amnesty had to shuffle awkwardly away from their partners. The issue I raised was about the ethical conduct of my own organization and the terms on which it chose and engaged with internal external partners. It was my attempt to hold Amnesty International to account, and it succeeded to the extent that Amnesty was thoroughly exposed through media interviews and press attention. The greatest success, though, went almost unnoticed, and that was the admission by Acting Secretary General Claudio, Claudio Cordone that defensive jihad, defensive jihad is not antithetical to human rights. Now, what does this double negative mean? Defensive jihad, as Beg had explained, is seen by, by Islamists as the individual duty of every Muslim. It is not, as some might like to frame it, an Islamic version of a liberation struggle. It is about the killing of all those who do not conform of unbelievers, dissidents, women, minorities, and most especially women in minorities. Defense's jihad is the theory that justified mass rape, sexual slavery, and the burning of Yazidi women. Six years on, the third on the third, uh, in fact, six years ago on the third of June, ISIS burnt 
19 Yazidi girls to death in Mosul. But nowhere in the numerous legal cases brought by American organizations, such as the Center for Constitutional Rights or the ACLU, in their public advocacy for terror suspects, will you find an examination of incitement to kill by Al-Qaeda figures. Anwar al a senior Al-Qaeda ideologue, for instance, said, hatred of the kuffar, that's unbelievers, is a central element of our military creed. While the CCR challenged the right-wing talk show host, Glenn Beck, about incitement to gay hatred, they defended Orlaki as an incendiary preacher who was protected by the First Amendment. I, I have links to, uh, to with more information on these that should come up in the uh, chat. I have little time to elaborate these quite complex matters. So let me tell, te let me just say that the studied ignorance of violent incitement is a key part of the poisoned process of policymaking. Ignorance is not accidental, but carefully nurtured. And it did not start with the war on terror. In the past, human rights organizations had focused their demands on the state and tended to ignore atrocities committed by so-called non-state actors. That meant that a great deal of violence directed at, at civilians and particularly women was not considered suitable for investigation. And non-state actors, which is a huge umbrella human rights term, um, in the community and family could be husbands, fathers, village councils, militias, etc., are responsible for the majority of assaults on women. It meant that a vast amount of what happened to women was ignored. When I joined Amnesty, and this was ignored in the way policy was constructed. So when I joined Amnesty in 2002, they had failed to determine any genocide had taken place in the 20th century. I'm talking about after the founding of Amnesty and after the the broadening of the mandate that Isol talked about. Nor had they collected the kind of evidence that might have assisted a court in determining a genocide. Rape had been ignored in Bangladesh in 71, where the Pakistan army and its allied Islamist death squads had run torture centers and held women for rape. In former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, Amnesty had found no evidence of rape. A global campaign to stop violence against women, women for which I was responsible as head of the gender unit, was supposed to address some of these lacunae. But as I described in two conversations, which should also come up in the chat, once women were subjects of human, were considered subjects of human rights, human rights lawyers fought hard to ensure that women's experience of violence did not sully the carefully constructed human rights norms around torture and terrorism. But the problem did not start with the war on terror. As Mari M. A. Eli Lucas, who founded the network of women living under Muslim laws revealed three women who were members of Amnesty Algeria asked that Amnesty reports on violence in Algeria did not only concentrate on state violence against Islamists, but also investigate Islamist violence against civilians. For raising this matter internally in very much the same language I used with Amnesty, they were expelled in the 1990s. And, th and that's why the admission that Amnesty had no problem with the key ideological, um, uh, the key ideology of Al Qaeda um, was such an important admission uh, to to have achieved, um, and 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 I see that as a success of accountability. When Amnesty finally began to discuss a position on abortion, it was a victory that a policy position finally emerged after six years of discussion which enabled Amnesty to oppose the criminalization of women having abortions. But the language was nowhere near a feminist position that women should have control over their bodies. So looking back, I was in successful in framing the argument as uh, the issue is an argument within hu the human rights movement rather than attack on the idea of human rights. But I utterly failed to shift the culture of human rights organizations. And the issues that I'm raising are um, far wider than Amnesty International. As I said at the time, the tragedy here is that the necessary defense of the torture standard has been inexcusably allied to the political legitimization of individuals and organizations belonging to the Islamic right. It need not be like this, I wrote at the time. It is the majesty of human rights law that rights are inalienable, and torture in particular admits of no exception. 
There is no need to massage the facts, sideline or denounce those who challenge them. There is no need to create a highly partial account, in effect, a narrative of innocence. But in opposing torture, Amnesty International and indeed Human Rights Watch, Reprieve, the Center for Constitutional Rights, and many other organizations around the world had deliberately failed to recognize that the victims they were defending could also be perpetrators. These views were seeded in organizations and do donor foundations throughout the progressive world and affected their policies too, freezing out secular ad advocates, ex-Muslims, and anyone who challenged this warped but dominant version of human rights. As I watch recent events, unfolding, the hounding of feminists, women losing jobs for speaking out, and the creation of a belief system where violent individuals are characterized as ultimate victims, I am in familiar territory. This is the rerun of a movie we have seen many times. For us, it may be a horror film, but for some viewers, it is a romance between a muscular, hard-edged human rights legal framework and the wispy floating signifiers of queer and gender theory, whose high priestess is Judith Butler and whose Bible is the Yogyakarta principles. But this romance is also a remake. By tortuous means, Butler's acolytes, the academic Sabah Mahmood and Humaira Iftikar, uh, two Pakistani um, origin women, managed to drag, to use the drag queen example to to exalt the piety of violent fundamentalist Muslim women and sanitize their organizations. I mean, this is really quite bizarre. And to find out how they did it, you'll have to read two other brilliant Pakistani women, Saadia Abbas and Afia Zaherbanu Zia, who have taken apart um, these narratives. So in my reading, the love of Islamism preceded the current ascendancy of a misogynist version uh, of pro-trans activism. But these are probably polyamorous circles and quite able to conduct several unlikely romances at the same time. And indeed, it's the same people within the human rights organizations who are promoting both these narratives. So queer theorists, many in gender studies departments, have been central to the attack on secularism and the idea of universal human rights. And this, of course, is curious as they're simultaneously promoting their gender queer views globally. The accountability work that I have done since I left Amnesty with several wins is to do what feminists have always done. We have led and created our own campaigns, not waited for human rights organizations. So working with secular women's groups in the One Law for All campaign, we successfully used equality law to challenge discriminatory legal guidance produced by the Law Society. Uh, and, and guidance on gender segregation by Universities UK. Uh, by this, I mean sexual apartheid and very different from autonomous single-sex spaces. We too fight against the existence of Sharia courts in this country, meaning the UK, and take up cases to ensure that Muslim women can access their rights. But the courts are very uncertain fora, and our clashes with the British government have taught me the problems we are up against are not only on the left, in my view, the Law Commission is bent on creating a kind of millet system, such as in the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, of, of uh, parallel uh, legal systems, and strengthening the position of religious fundamentalists, damning women's rights and legitimizing Sharia courts. The government appointed review, and that is the Tory government, the uh, previous Tory government under May, into Sharia was so appalling that we were forced to boycott it but we collected far more evidence of the harms of women's use of Sharia courts than the official inquiry did. So there is another movie that's also running in my head as I watch this unfolding drama. My challenge to Amnesty was on the ethics of partnering in what, and so, and in effect, that, that movie is about what kind of buddy movie are we in? Who do we work with and what are our red lines? I am alarmed at some of the discourse on gender, which fails to recognize the use of the word as feminists have classically used it, to mean the social construction of roles and norms and behaviors of each sex. I don't believe that male violence or sex-based violence captures it entirely. Where the bonds of patriarchy have not loosened, 
women are often the prime perpetrators of violence against women or girls, often against their own daughters. And the language of gender-based violence has been used by women all over the world to mobilize and indeed inserted, inserted into the human rights framework uh, to, in order to insert the concerns of feminists. We should not abandon it. Conversely, the term gender ideology is used by gender critical feminists, many of whom do not know that is also used in completely different ways by far right governments and by the Vatican to attack feminism, lesbians and gays and trans people um, in ways that we should all, if we oppose discrimination, be firmly against. These are not groups and people and organizations that we should in any way be allying with. And finally, on the issue of erasure of women, please spare thought for women all over the world who are not simply being linguistically erased. We work with women who are not only being stripped of their rights, but being murdered in large numbers, like the 85 girls who were killed in a school in, in Afghanistan uh, for simply because they were girls accessing, accessing an education and because they came from the Hazara Shia minority. The kinds of issues that I deal with uh, in, in, um, in my work with the One Law for All campaign, uh, with the Center of Secular Space, which I founded, which is not a funded institute, but still exists as an idea with a loose uh, coalition of women around it, um, and Feminist Dissent, uh, a journal on all kinds of religious fundamentalism, looks at these different kinds of religious fundamentalism and their connections with neoliberalism. For instance, the, the um, rape ideology that I described as central to defensive jihad has its counterpart uh, in the ideology of Hindutva, which I described in an article, Hindutva Past and Present, uh, where at the foundation uh, of this ideology of the Hindu far right uh, and of the, of the ruling party in India at the moment, um, the rape of Muslim women uh, is, uh, has been mobilized as a central uh, element of hate. Um, so when we talk about accountability, we really have to talk, I think, about the accountability that we have to each other as social movements, as activists and feminists, uh, as well as the people we are choosing to hold to account. If we do not guard ourselves, we cannot place the challenge to the human rights organization and others. We cannot ask them who will guard the guardian if we are incapable of guarding ourselves. Thank you.